Shevchenko Grasso 2 just wrapped up and it ends in a split draw. After that, we have JDM beating Kevin Holland. We have Raul Rosas Jr. getting bad on track. We've got some crazy stoppages and some crazy scorecards, including one in the main event that you might not have seen yet. Let's get right into it. But before we get into it, if you could like, sub, do all the YouTube stuff, it really does help me out a lot. If you look at it, it pushes the videos out to way more people. If you just take two seconds to like, let's get into it. As per usual, we're starting off at the very bottom. We'll talk about each of the fights. I'll run through these prelims pretty quick and then we'll get towards Shevchenko, Grasso, JDM, and I'm sure we'll get into them a little bit more. Starting off at the very bottom, Jos Josephine Knutson, who was on the Contender Series, won her fight via decision, wins another decision, really just outclassed or smoked. You see a 30 24 scorecard there. You don't see that a lot. After that, we have Charlie Campbell, who came in on short notice to fight Alex Reyes, knocked him out in round one, was a huge favorite, just too slick, too good on the feet. After that, we have Tracy Cortez, who, you know, kicked up a bit of a fuss this week with, uh, with you know, her looks. She was fighting Jasmine Jazdadevicius, and I'm happy that she won. Won via decision. It was a pretty clear decision, 30-27 in my eyes. But after that, we've got Daniel Asoda, Edgar Chárez, and this is where the first kind of Weird things happen happens in the night. Round one, three minutes in, you see a position where Edgar Shiras kind of has him in a headlock, and it's not really a choke. You can hear like the commentators are saying, "I wouldn't know personally that good if it's a choke or not," just purely because like I don't do jujitsu or any of that. I box, but I don't do like jujitsu or any kind of wrestling. But you can hear like DC, the commentators, even John Anik, they all know that's not a choke. That's not a choke. That's not a choke. But he is like in the kind of choking position where you have seen people standing get choked. You see his arms go limp, which is a sign that when someone's arm goes limp, once they stop fighting it, that, uh, that they're, they're out cold. So the ref stops it. And even John Anik in DC, I'm going to try to pull up a clip. Hopefully UFC don't copyright me, but I'll try to get a clip for us. You can see here, Edgar Shiras has him kind of in that choke. And you can see that it does look like a position where he's putting a lot of pressure on him and where it could be a choke. But I'll let you listen to the commentary. That's, you can hear it immediately. John Anik goes, no, no, no. You need to learn how to grapple as a ref. That's why you need to know how to grapple as a ref. Because he isn't out. You can see he's not tapping. He's not out. His arm does go limp. DC actually says he's out. He's out. So it's a mistake that you can make as a ref. I think when you've got the best angle and you're kind of looking in at it, you need to be able to know and decipher it. It's a bad mistake for a ref. It gets ruled a no contest. It just kind of ruins that fight. I don't know. It leaves a bit of a sour taste in your mouth when you're like, the refing was bad. The judging was bad in my eyes on this card. And definitely once I show you the scorecards for this uh, Shevchenko fight, you're definitely going to agree with me that the judging is bad on it. But anyway, apart from that, let's get back to the rest of the fights. Roman Kopolov looks slick in his fight, man. He looked good. He busted up Josh Fremd. He had a bloody nose after round one. The jab was looking good. The body shots were looking good. You could see this red streak all down his body just from body kicks. And he eventually finished him with, a, I think it was a hook to the body, a liver shot, and he just dropped in, like, couldn't fight anymore. And that liver shot, man, it kills you. It shuts down your body, but he bullied him. He was just at a different level. The kicks to the body, the fluidity, the jabs, the one-twos, everything was perfect. And his takedown defense was really, really good in this fight as well. After that, we have Lupi Godinez against Elise Reed. Just caught her in a rear naked choke. Once again, it was a close-ish fight. You probably give Lupi round one. At least just kept on getting caught on the feet and then eventually got caught in a rear naked choke. Now, finally, we're on to the main card. The first of the kind of weird judging. I do think Kyle Nelson won this fight. Fernando Padilla won the first round pretty clearly. Then after that, you have, I had Kyle Nelson winning two and three. So I like these first two scorecards. I like 28-29 and I like 28-29. I think that they're both good scorecards. 30-27, I don't know what you're watching. I'd love to know. I'd love to know who gave the 30-27 scorecard. Is it the same guy all the way up that gives this same scorecard up here? You can see I'll get on to this. Don't get me started on this. I'll get on to this. It's the same people all the time that are giving out these shit scorecards. I don't know how it's happening. I don't know where, where, I don't know. Like there needs to be some kind of a disciplinary thing with judges of some sort where they go through review and why is, why is there bad decision after bad decision after bad decision after bad decision? We definitely need to look at it. I still think the judges should be interviewed after each fight and be like, why did you do that? What was, a, what was the criteria there? Why did you score it like that? After this, we had Daniel Zellhuber, who looked really good in this fight. To be honest, Christos looked real good in round one. He fought a good fight, kind of keeping him at range, kind of 
flung the jab out, but he got the choke in the second round, Anaconda choke. It was a nice finish. I'd highly advise you to go watch it if you haven't seen it. It's nice to see Mexican guys win in Mexico because, you know, the crowd kind of gets riled up and gets crazy. So uh, that was nice to see. Nice to see Daniel Zellhober get a win. 14 and 1 now. Christos did look good. He just got caught in a choke. He just, you know, kind of got caught in the moment, caught in a choke. After that, we have the return of Raul Rosas Jr. He was fighting Terence Mitchell. I was wrong about this fight. I was wrong. I'll be the first one to admit it, okay? I was wrong. I thought that this fight would be a lot closer than it was. I thought Terence Mitchell coming into UFC, he's only lost to Cameron Simon. I thought Cameron Simon's a he's a dog, you know what I mean? Like he's he's really one of those guys in the UFC. Fighting Raul Rosas Jr. I did pick Raul Rosas Jr. Don't get me wrong, I picked him to do it. But he did it in he just got out there and got after him immediately. Terence Mitchell just I don't know, he didn't really live with him. Obviously, round 150 seconds in, if you get KO'd, he got KO'd via punches on the ground. It wasn't like a one punch knockout or anything. But he just took him down and mauled him. And he just got mauled. Essentially, the whole fight looked like it was a different class. It's a nice little stepping stone for Raul Rosas Jr. Kind of get him back on track. Get him back to the spot that they want him to be, where they can build him up to be this young UFC star. So I'm happy for Raul Rosas Jr. I'm happy he got his win. And uh, I feel bad for Terrence Mitchell because he's fought Cameron Sayman, Dog, and Raul Rosas Jr. Who kind of got fraud checked in his last fight, which I think he needed. I think he needed that to know that he's like, come as that Icarus mentality where it's like he's top he's on he's on top of the world he's on top of the world he's gonna be the youngest UFC champion and it's like you didn't train hard enough for that fight your cardio wasn't good enough for that fight so I think that reset in him coming back and getting this win is really good for him after that we have Kevin Holland JDM these scorecards I don't know I personally had it 29 28 Kevin Holland but I think what this shows is one of the main problems with Kevin Holland style, obviously you didn't see it with Sean Strickland because he dominated last week, but in close decisions, if you have that Philly Shell style, the Philly Shell style is, you know, when you see fighters and they're kind of like moving like this and they've got their shoulder up here and they've got one hand here, one hand low, it's called a Philly Shell. Floyd Mayweather used to use it. It's super popular in boxing. And I think it's just a little bit different in MMA when it comes to close, close decisions. And I'm not sure, it, I think it might change over time with judges, but Judges don't appreciate the defense that Kevin Holland has because it looks like he's getting hit cleanly with punches. You can see the punches are kind of hitting his glove or they're hitting over here and he's kind of leaning the way and they're hitting his shoulder. Judges aren't fully recognizing that yet and they're thinking that he's getting hit with clean shots. And the reason why it's different in, in MMA and in boxing is just because of the glove size. Look, I'll play this glove. If I show you this, okay? This is just like a normal 69th boxing glove. Yeah, with the Philly shell, when you're holding it, yeah, your arm's kind of like this. So with a glove that's this big, this glove is pretty much the same size as my head. If I put it like beside my head, you'll see like it's pretty much the same size as my head, okay? So what happens with it is when I'm defending like this, you can clearly see that the punches aren't hitting me in the head because like they're bouncing off the glove or they're bouncing off the shoulder and the glove is big enough to show that I'm able to like protect myself from everything, to parry, to do anything. Whereas in MMA, you've got like the small glove. You've got almost pretty much like your fist and a little bit more, which doesn't properly show that you're defending punches. So judges see it and they think you're getting hit and you're getting hit through it, which you are getting hit through it. But the defense is still good. He's still blocking punches. He's still rolling with punches. Well, don't get me wrong. I don't hate the decision. I don't hate the decision. I don't think it's a bad decision. But I think personally that it's just the style. It's just the Philly Shell style. If you disagree with me and think I'm talking shit, let me know. But I think it's literally just to do with how little it's seen in MMA. Like judges don't see it a lot, so they don't really know how the defense works well enough uh, in MMA. I don't even know if the defense works well enough in MMA. I don't know if, if with those small gloves, if the defense works well. Uh, it worked well for Sean Strickland, but with Kevin Holland, it makes me think that in close decisions, the judges are going to think that you're getting hit with more punches and more punches clean because you're rocking that kind of style where it looks like you're getting hit. Whereas the, the punch might be hitting the glove or hitting your shoulder, but it looks like you're getting hit. But I don't hate the decision. If we run through the stats really quick, total strikes, Kevin Holland missed a lot of strikes. JDM was really good at making them miss. Kevin Holland had a lot of output. I'm still excited to see him at 170. I think he's still definitely got a future at 170, more than 185. Kevin Holland looks slick. His striking looks good. He did well to get inside on Kevin Holland because Kevin Holland's big, long, he's rangy. He's a difficult guy to hit. Um, but I think it was a good decision. I think it was a great fight. I'll probably do a video tomorrow on who I want each of these guys to fight next, kind of the winners all the way. 
And then uh, up at this level, I'll do who I want Kevin Holland, who I want JDM, who I want Valentino, who I want Grasso. That's kind of obvious though. And on to the main event, Alexa Grasso against Valentina Shevchenko. I thought this was a great fight. I really, really, really did think it was a great fight. Me personally, in my own scorecard, I had a 48-47 Grasso. I had her winning four, I had her winning five, and I had her winning... Sorry, the fights just happened. I'm trying to think in my head. Was it two? Let me pull up the scorecard. And I can't trust the judges' scorecards a lot, but I think that... that yeah, yeah, they all gave a round two, yeah, so it was two. This is the judges' scorecard. This is where my grievance comes in immediately. You're looking at the judges' scorecards. You're like, Mike Bell, Sal Amato, Junichiro Kamija, okay? I like this scorecard. I like this scorecard. I don't think that they're bad. I think that round four is the defining round. For me, Grasso with the knees, the bigger takedown. I think that on the feet, it was pretty even. You might give a slight, slight edge to Shevchenko, but I think you give the, like the knees, that, the knees to the head were great. They did a lot of damage. Kind of the clinch work was great. The takedown, it was a powerful takedown. She had that knee bar attempt at the end, which I know doesn't count for any, doesn't count for much, but it counts for something. But in this, when you look at this Mike Bell scorecard, why, 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 why is round five a 10 There's no justification, which is why I want them to, I want them to have to answer. I want Mike Bell to tell me, Mike Bell, why did you think that was a 10 Why? Why, do, why did you think that was a 10 It doesn't make any sense to me. I can't think of any logical reason why it would be a 10 If anything, the round two is a 10 where she gets knocked down. I don't think that, Shevchenko was in trouble for a lot of that round five. There was a few submission attempts, but it's not like Shevchenko was ever really close to tapping. Some of those rear naked chokes, some of those neck cranks, some of those face cranks were close, but Shevchenko never looked like she was in real trouble where you're like, this fight's going to get finished. And I think that you need to do a lot for a 10-8 in, in MMA, in, in the UFC, at least. In boxing, it's, if you get a knockdown, it's a 10-8. In the UFC, it's not like that. And I think it's a terrible, terrible scorecard, which kind of ruins the anticipation of the night because if Valentina wins this, me personally, I had it for Alexa Grasso, but I don't think it's a terrible decision. This kind of muddies up the waters a little bit around the decision because it isn't a 10-8. So then the title would be going to Shevchenko's way. But I think that some of these, like the round four, I'd have to rewatch it, but I really do think the round four goes to Alexa Grasso. Let me know what your scorecard was on it. I'm interested to see everyone's scorecards just to know if I'm bugging. But I think it was a great fight. Taken away from the shit, the shit scorecard and the fact that we need people like Mike Bell to be disciplined, to be interviewed, to, you know, maybe you take them off for the next few events. Same with the refs where the ref has a shitty stoppage and it fucks up a fight. Like, that's a whole camp for these guys. They're not getting win money now. They're only getting their show money. They're not getting performance of the night or whatever. One of the finishes of the night. They're not getting that money now, and that money is huge to them. That win for um, Edgar Chires would be huge. Like, that win when he's double his money. So it just kind of fucks them over, and I hate to see it. And with this, like, with this Mike Bell scorecard, it just muddies up the division where everyone, you don't really have an actual... Like, I didn't hate a draw when I first heard it. Don't get me wrong. I don't hate a draw. As a, as a, as a final outcome, I don't hate the draw. It's just the fact that it's a shit scorecard that makes it a draw. If he had this... Say this round four as 9-9. Nine, nine. I'd be like, that's fair enough. Round four is 9-9. Nine, 10-9 nine, nine Grasso in the final round. I'd go, yeah, that's fair. I don't think that's a bad scorecard. But the fact that he's given it as a 10-8 just leaves a sour taste in my mouth. Um, looking at the striking stats in it, it was pretty close. Alexa Grasso had more strikes. Valentina had a lot of, uh, in that round three, that round one, she had a lot of... Um, Control time, sorry, I don't know why I forgot the word. She had a lot of control time, and uh, she kind of dominated. As you can see, 8 minutes, 37 of control time. I'm sure if I broke it down round by round, you see that a lot of that is round 1, round 3. Round 4, she had little bits of control time, and round 5, she made the fatal mistake of giving up her back. That's what let Alexa Grasso back into it, and what gave me the round 5 in her eyes, that she was on her back for, what, nearly 2 minutes, 2 and a half minutes? If Valentina kept that fight standing and didn't go for that takedown, I think she had her on the feet. I really do think that she was better than her on the feet. And uh, the jab was really good from Valentina Shevchenko. Alexa Grasso couldn't seem to find her range properly. The one-two wasn't really hitting. Anytime that she tried to, I feel like she couldn't really get combos off unless she was like right up against the fence or in the clinch. I feel like she struggled with that. Whereas Valentina, I feel like could let the one-two fly, could let a one-two hook fly. I think that 
the leg kicks from Grasso were good, but it didn't really seem to affect Valentina that that much. I thought it was a great fight. I can't wait to see it again. I think it's one of the best fights to make in a women's mixed martial arts. That's all that I've got for you boys today. I'll make a video tomorrow on the matchups just because it's 624 in the morning for me. I'll make a video tomorrow on like uh, the matchups and who I think people should fight next. Appreciate all you boys for tuning in. I appreciate all the love on the videos before on the breakdown and everything. And uh, yeah, I'll catch all of you boys tomorrow. Make sure to do all the YouTube shit before I go, you know, like sub, do all that shit. It really does help me out. Peace.